Um, so this talk today will be, uh, for some people, it'll be an introduction to trying to look at some statistics of deep neural networks. For others, this may be uh, more interesting in terms of seeing how do you uh, develop kind of a research uh, strategy for approaching uh, a challenge like this. So uh, but I guess uh, before we start, can I ask who here has trained already a deep neural network? Yeah, okay, almost everyone. And who here has worked with PyTorch or at least had some experience with it? Nice, okay, about half. So uh, we'll try to have something new. I think uh, the statistic is probably new for most people, uh, but uh, we'll try to keep it also general and show lots of pictures so you have kind of more an impression. And hopefully, if you have questions, we can talk about that afterwards. So uh, about me, um, my name is Justin Schenk, and I'm a PhD candidate at Radboud University in Nijmegen, Netherlands. I'm also a research engineer at Peltarion, based in Stockholm, Sweden. And my background is in neuroscience research from uh, Texas, uh, U.S., so quite international already. And uh, um, the results here were developed uh, during research at Osterbrook University in Germany and also with Peltarion. So what uh, Peltarion builds and what, I'm, what I work on with them uh, is, a, is a deep neural network model builder. And so if you, for example, wanted to build the deep neural network, uh, you wanted to be able to do it in a graphical interface and have sharing your models, version controls, uh, de deployment, all that, it's really nice. So um, that's, that's kind of the background. Um, an application of that, for that uh, similar model that uh, is deepemotion.io, you can drag a video to the, to the page and you get the emotions, uh, the facial expressions recognized from frames. So that's one application you could check out that uses that same technology. And I'm also part of the Intel Software Innovator Program, which does early prototyping for, uh, for uh, Intel hardware and software, like the Novidius, Novidius Neural Compute Stick. So I'll introduce some motivation. So what makes the challenge of uh, improving the neural network topology interesting? And uh, I'll introduce the convolutional autoencoder because that's the base model that I've been that I was using in this research. And I'll also uh, motivate why using a PyTorch implementation rather than TensorFlow, and uh, or an, any other framework. Uh, also, some visualizations of these uh, pre-activations that, uh, that are used for uh, understanding the statistic uh, here. And then I'll give a, kind of the final result for the layer saturation. This is this metric that's used to determine how over-parameterized or under-parameterized your layer is because you want to, to get really high test accuracy, but you also want to uh, understand the dynamics of your network. And if we have time, we'll, we can go through questions. So the motivation starts with if you start building deep neural networks and you're doing it, uh, say you're doing it uh, from scratch or you're starting with the template, some idea of where to start, there's always one question that pops up is how many, how many units do I need in any given hidden layer? So, so if it's a dense layer, why do I have 10, 10 100, or 32? Well, where does this number come from? And it seems kind of magical. It's like it's pulled out of air or someone uh, figured it out maybe empirically. They found out this is the best for this given model and this given layer. But as soon as you start experimenting, you, you want to have more insight into where does this number come from or where, what is guiding this process other than test accuracy. So not only do we want to understand this number, but we also want to Im improve our models. We want to optimize them not just for test accuracy, but also for training time. Um, an example of when that's uh, necessary is we have this uh, um, model that was built at Peltarion for predicting weather. And uh, it uses a convolutional uh, LSTM uh, with an autoencoder to reduce this high dimensional satellite data into a 2,000 unit uh, bottleneck. And that 2,000 unit bottleneck is then pushed on to an LSTM. But why 2,000 units? Why not 200? Why not 20,000? Um, so understanding the practical constraints there is necessary when you're optimizing the, the network. Also, for innovating, it's useful to have some insight into the statistics, like why, like what is happening when I change this layer? How does it affect the next layer? That's something that you don't get out of the box 
uh, with any frameworks. So that's part of the motivation for building Delve. So why? So starting with an autoencoder, I chose an autoencoder as the baseline model to do the test with because, for one, we had the use case uh, at the Peltarian with the weather, understanding whether they have an autoencoder that reduces the dimensions for your input down to one uh, vector. But also, it's really simple to understand theoretically. It's mapping an input into a reconstruction of the input. So, uh, yeah, writing papers and so forth becomes a little cleaner, right? Um, so, but then also we have this nice bottleneck that can be understood. So, anything that I say about how do we reduce or how do we understand the number of units in a hidden layer? So, a hidden layer and the bottleneck is using them interchangeably here because it's the same uh, effect. And uh, other possible uses for autoencoders than for weather, you can. Um, you can touch on that they're used for denoising, for example. You could denoise images or for generative uh, purposes, so variational autoencoders. And again, if you're building a generative autoencoder or generative model, and you want to know how many units do I need in this layer, this is going to be a useful uh, concept there as well. Uh, generally, so convolutional autoencoder is, uh, has that purpose of reducing the inputs into uh, a low dimensional representation. And the convolutional part is where you convolve a this feature kernel here in gray over an image blue and you get a nice green feature map out. So that lets you detect certain patterns like edges in the images. Uh, yeah, also when you go from those feature maps in the green, so say you have one for each channel RGB, then you want to push them into a bottleneck, you can just flatten all of those feature maps and you get a nice long uh, bottleneck layer. Mm, perhaps for added challenge to this task, I chose an Inception V3 network. So what they were using at Peltarian before was a, a VGG network and Inception V3 was known to have a higher accuracy on uh, ImageNet challenge. It's very deep with 48 layers and it introduces some some new tricks here, where, for example, the one-by-one one convolution, uh, where you can take the several channels and you can convolve across those dimensions. So say you have RGB, and you just kind of put a pole right through them and sum them up. So uh, to, uh, right, the input size that's required for inception is 299 by 299. Um, for my experiments, I used uh, CIFAR-10, which uh, if anyone's worked with that before, the, the size is 32 by 32. So we had to upsample and downsample to get to 299 by 299. So it's a bit overkill for the purpose, but uh, easier to work with the data. And the motivation for choosing PyTorch was you get a lot of things, uh, you get access to a lot of features with PyTorch that you wouldn't get directly with other implementations. Uh, TensorFlow has uh, perhaps improved that with their eager execution. But uh, for this specific kind of metric, it was uh, it's super easy to pull it out from a PyTorch model. And I'll show what that looks like. Um, it, let's, let's show what that, what that looks like. So the, the other tools that were useful in, in trying to um, develop a statistic for layer over-parameterization uh, were Torch Vision, which lets you load in CIFAR 10 data out of the box again, and uh, IPy widgets. So if you're living in a Jupyter Notebook environment and you want to visualize your data, and you don't want to send it over to TensorBoard every time that you want to you know, inspect something. It's really useful if you have a quick, uh, responsive API for something that lets you visualize it. And in this case, it was IPy widgets. So, um, what level are we talking about in terms of uh, the neural network? So, if you're familiar with the inputs and the activations and the weights coming from each of the nodes, then you have what's called this pre activation state or latent representation, uh, which then an activation function is applied to. So your output of the layer is, is going to be the activations. And before it gets, before you apply ReLU or hyperbolic tangents, you have the pre-activation state. In PyTorch, it's super easy to pull that out because you can just apply your fully convolutional layer onto, like a fully convolutional 
uh, operator on the layer. And then you have a, so in this case, a thousand dimensional uh, tensor. And you can just add, you convert it to NumPy. Uh, first, you have to put it on the CPU if you're using GPU. And then convert to NumPy and then append it to a list within your class or your environment. And, and that way you can get a list of those vectors of the preactivations for, uh, for, for that specific layer. And then you can, if in the autoencoder case, you just decode that directly. So that's your code. Um, how the, when you're decoding from, in this case of the Inception autoencoder, uh, you have, again, that code, that long, uh, that long vector, and you want to reshape that into something that looks like images. Uh, so you're going to uh, reshape it into five by five patches, or could be whichever dimensions, but you can reshape it uh, using the view, uh, view method. And then your decoding occurs normally. You can you could have a totally reversed, uh, like a symmetric autoencoder where you do everything from inception, but then reverse it. But uh, I don't recommend it with inception. Uh, in this case, you can just simplify that your life and uh, do a few uh, transpose convolutions and uh, and add a dense layer or two in there. So that's how the autoencoder is going to work. If you want to, to visualize things in this environment with the Jupyter Notebook and the iPy widgets. Uh, it's really nice. It also makes really nice uh, GIFs or GIFs uh, if you want to show what your research is doing and how it's how like how you can change parameters to modify what the output is. Uh, I can only recommend it. So like in this case I was looking where does early stopping occur for different models, uh, models with different uh, bottleneck sizes. Uh, given certain parameters for early stopping. So assuming that I have the patients and the minimum delta fixed, how did the training look for those different models? So uh, that was useful in this case. And uh, the IPI widget usage is you can define any arbitrary function and then uh, call the IPI widget interactive method and include that function as an argument. Uh, one of the first things I was curious about is, is there a pattern in how the these uh, preactivation states and, and the distribution of values in that preactivation state? So again, to give you some intuition where we are, we are in the, in the autoencoder case, we're at the bottleneck, and we've got a, a vector of, say, 10 or 100 or 1,000 units, and we want to know how many of them are you know, really large scalar values, how many of them are closer to zero, and how does that change over training? So this little widget was used to, uh, was developed to see the change over time, and in this case, the the blue was the early in the training, and the green was uh, later in the training. So there was a gradual broadening of the values. So that gave me some insight that there is a change in the distribution of these values over training. Is, is there some way we can detect some kind of pattern to indicate, okay, your values are getting off center or your values are, um, you know, there's some kind of pattern that's occurring that can suggest, okay, now it's time to hop off the training or it's time to reduce your, the size of your layer. So in, in terms of uh, plotting, so if we wanted to, uh, in the X dimension here, we have the bottleneck layer size. So as you increase bottleneck layer size, then your test loss will decrease, which makes sense. So you start off with 10 units in a bottleneck and it's not enough. So, but as soon as you, you increase that to 16 or 32, you get big jumps, uh, improvements in your test loss. But uh, at some point, it, you kind of plateau, right? So there's not much difference in this case between the uh, 32 and the 64. So how do you identify where that is? How do you identify that? That's kind of the main uh, problem to solve, is how do you, how do you know uh, if further making your model bigger is going to make any uh, marginal improvements and also considering the amount of time it takes to train. So, so the method that, that I applied was I can decomposition of this preactivation matrix. So again with the bottleneck you take the history of those uh, bottlenecks over time then you make a covariance matrix from that and then you can apply eigen decomposition. So with NumPy it's np.cov and then uh, np linalg uh, eigen h and then you get the uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues out so as, as a reminder what that is 
your eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors are the, you can think of it as the, the directions that are necessary to explain all of the variants. And so your eigen, eigenvalues are your scalars uh, that when multiplied by a vector give you that matrix times that vector. So that's the terminology in the background for that. And then the spectrum is just the set of the eigenvalues. So say you have, uh, you know, 10 dimensions, you'll have t 10 eigenvalues and vectors. You want to have the, you want to put all those eigenvalues into a set. So I wanted to visualize these uh, changes, these, uh, the uh, directions of activation uh, and over training and see how that changes. So started plotting the, uh, these are the eigenvalues for the first, uh, uh, the first uh, eigenvectors and seeing how that changes over training for different, uh, for models with different size uh, bottlenecks. And then also tried normalizing that. By itself, that didn't give me any, any insight, but it made pretty graphs. So, but the question then is, maybe we can figure out how many directions are needed to explain 99% of the variance. So the motivation for referring to 99% of the variance actually you know, comes about uh, from, a, some, from another paper, Singular Vector Canonical Correlation Analysis by Raghu et al. And uh, th they're trying to achieve a similar goal using a, a different method. You want to be able to find out, based on something like a PCA, Principal Component Analysis, of the, the bottlenecks, if you can figure out how many directions or how many units, so the goal is to get to the units, how many units are necessary to explain the variance. It's quite a jump, actually, but it does give us some insight into the, to the training dynamics. So by plotting, by plotting different uh, neural networks with different uh, over different times of the neural networks, uh, as this is the line moving to the right, that's over training. Uh, we were able to see when does it require so many, you know, x percent of. So on the left, it's it's the ratio. When does it require that uh, x percent of the um, of the uh, eigenvectors to explain 99% of the variance. And that would hopefully give us some insight into when the layer has already been saturated or when does it have space to be filled. So what I thought was maybe more insightful and, and still promising, but I won't be able to continue this research at the moment, so feel free to take it over, uh, is looking at the phase transitions. So for example, say you have those eigenvalues, and you have the first, here's the top three eigenvalues over training. By themselves, it doesn't tell you much except that it's always increasing, generally increasing, right? Um, but if you look at the first derivative of it, you start to see dips and changes. And if you see the second derivative, you see dips and changes as well. So there's perhaps a reason to think that if you're tra while your model is training, if you get data in, it could be seen as something of an anomaly for the model or that the model is not, uh, say, that, that that instance or that batch coming in has a certain type of effect on the layer with that specific number of units. So it'd be interesting perhaps to do more statistical analysis on that. So um, another tool that was used here to kind of explain and show to people what I was doing, because you can only get so far unless you can communicate your results is uh, making a nice interactive decoding in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. So with this, we're able to take any given bottleneck. So you're experimenting with several different size bottleneck uh, autoencoders, and you can decode it in the browser. And you're able to perturbate the model by changing the activation or the pre-activation states for uh, any given unit within that layer. It's nice for seeing, if, for example, how sensitive a certain model is to uh, perturbations at specific units. And then uh, around this time, it, it became pretty clear that you need to visualize the actual activations over training. So taking the CIFAR 10 data set, which is uh, 10 categories of uh, horse, uh, frog, dog, uh, automobile, and then see how over time those different uh, bottleneck embeddings where did they go into a PCA space? And you see that it's that it, there's quite a consistent trajectory. In this case, the red is automobile. 
as a consistent trajectory that they follow. And uh, in three dimensions, there's even more interesting kind of seahorse structure here. So it would be really interesting to find out, for example, if you could make this more efficient so that that way it could all be mapped into uh, a single dimension, right? If you're, if you're doing PCA and you find that you have uh, kind of a circle or an arc, then you can apply linear PCA, you can straighten that out and try to reduce the number of dimensions needed to explain all the variance. And again, the motivation is if we can explain the variance of the activations for these bottlenecks with less number of units, that would be good. Then we can say, okay, here's a tip. You know, reduce the number of units you have in this layer. So this gives us at least some encouragement that this, there is structure within these, this embedding space and that there's something we could do to kind of draw a line between it and find that. So... So we saw what decoding these embeddings looked like. What, are the, what do the embeddings look like themselves? And, I mean, they're pretty noisy, as you can guess, but what's kind of interesting is when you look within class, you do see certain patterns. I mean, it makes sense that a model trained to detect patterns for automobile or, uh, or bird is going to see those instances similarly. But how similar? I mean, is it similar to the naked eye similar? And you do see certain consistent, uh, I mean, it could be, it's not yet empirically validated, but you see some perhaps similar patterns and activations for within class uh, instances. So that's kind of, kind of interesting, but yet it doesn't yet tell you how to apply it. Uh, after training, the, the, the activations were smoother and more consistent within a more narrow range. So the jumping to the part where it, the application is. So from the research and trying to put together the tools and look for a method that gives you some insight into the pattern and the, the dynamics. Um, next was building Delve. And Delve is a pip li uh, Python library that you can install. Pip install Delve. And when you run it with uh, the example, in this case the deep neural network, or a simple one, it will uh, show you the layer saturation, which is the number of units required to explain 99% of the variance uh, so, uh, of this preactivation matrix. So in this case, we have, say, three, uh, three layers, and we're modifying a, a hidden layer. And we want to see how does it affect the adjacent layers, and how, how does adjusting the size of that layer affect the saturation of that layer and of other layers. In this case, we have hidden, start with a hidden layer size 8. And as uh, that's a very small number, so you have high saturation. In this case, looking at linear 2, saturation is quite high. As you increase that layer size to 32, the linear 2 layer decreases. And what's also kind of interesting is that the following layer, layer 3, increases its saturation. So you, you have a compensatory increase. As you increase the, make the, the layer longer, then it requires more, uh, requires more uh, units to, to account for all the variance. Okay. Uh, perhaps that's also more clear in this case. So here we have a six layer um, fully connected uh, network doing a regression task. And we can see that as, so what this is showing is overtraining with three different uh, uh, with models with three different size layers in the linear one space. Okay, so as you increase from 10 to 100 to 300, you see that the first layer, linear one, the uh, saturation actually decreases, right? So you increase the size, it decreases the saturation. And then in the linear two layer, you see a compensatory increase. So when the first layer decreases saturation, the second layer increases. So what kind of insight does that give us? It suggests that we can start to understand the dynamics of the neural network while it's training. But uh, perhaps maybe maybe more interesting for, for some of the users will be that it's visual and it gives you visual feedback, which is quite rare when you're trying to debug and design an architecture. Um, and this is actually the kind of, the kind of visual feedback that, that we're uh, looking to integrate into the Piltarian platform. We want to make sure that people who are using the network to build their layers and decide how many units 
that they're getting some feedback during training so they can say early, okay, this layer is, this layer is not doing what I expect it to do. I can tweak it by, in this direction. So you see it's, a, it's kind of a step around the AutoML problem is to give uh, engineers more control and feedback in the process. And the final results of the paper were that by, yes, by increasing the number of hidden units in a given layer, that the saturation decreased, and that we could use the number of uh, training samples, uh, the uh, number of uh, the test accuracy, and also the time to train. We can use those three f uh, features uh, for getting feedback into what is the optimal uh, layer size for our deep neural network. So, uh, if, if, uh, so I encourage you to try it out. Do pip install delve. Uh, on your PyTorch model and let me know how it goes. If you get more feedback about how to build your neural network, then that's great. Uh, or if you have questions, and uh, I would love to answer them for you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Okay, uh, I start with uh, saying that this is a really nice presentation. I actually thought of doing maybe not something similar, but to try to optimize the topology of the network. And it kind of inspired, uh, gave me some ideas. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, because if I get it right, you kind of check the saturation of the layers as you train. But at the beginning, the distribution of the weights is basically as you initialize them, right? So it's sort of, let's say, garbage at the beginning. And uh, after you train, then you can say something if the distribution is right, so if the saturation occurred or not. So at the beginning of the training, if I got it right, you can, cor of course, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, at the beginning of the training, you cannot get any insight if the layer is undersaturated or oversaturated because you are kind of mimicking the initial initialization, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the initial uh, initialization, that that's however you've decided it would be and usually it's random uh, random distribution so yeah that's right. following a question uh, so uh, technically it's a uh, you can get some info after you so after you are training because if you make it kind of brute force you just look at the test uh, loss and you see okay I'm, I'm getting something something so if I change this direction and then you see okay it's getting worse so I probably should have changed the other direction but your approach kind of gives the, maybe not the magnitude but the sign if I can say of mm -hmm. to which direction you should change tweak your tweak your layers right yes exactly um, it, it's it's so far empirically if, uh, I found that if it's between, say, 10 to 90 percent saturation, it's a really wide range. But it's enough that if you find that you are in that extreme, that you can correct it in the direction, in, in one direction. So uh, good uh, good point that, if I understand you, that it, it could be used to give more feedback, actually, if you could uh, target specifically or give feedback to the initialization. Yeah, yeah. So Okay, so one more quick remark. Could you please show the... Uh this paper, you showed some graph from the uh, table from the paper. Yeah. Could you show the name of the paper, maybe? Yeah, for a second? this is uh, in submission right now. To, in submission. To, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's under review uh, at uh, ML Prague. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see it and show it there. Okay, uh, thanks. I'll be happy to send you a preprint if you're interested. Right. Okay, I come sure. back. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I want to ask uh, whether you worked only with dense lawyers or you tried some different types of convolutional lawyers or I don't know. Yes, good, great question. So did I, I did try uh, with convolutional layers and Delve does support convolutional layers. Um, but uh, one thing that's not uh, trivial is to define how to make generalizations about convolutional layers. So, for example, so the method currently uses it makes a sum of the feature of each feature map in the convolutional layer. Uh, so, and then it tries to see how does that that sum or the sum or average uh, of that how does that change over training? So, 
yeah, it's still not exactly clear what the the best method for that is, but it does support that. So if you play with it and find some way to improve it, that would be cool. Write a paper about it. And uh, you, um, you've worked only with a task of uh, autoencoders. So it, you didn't make a classification or... I did also with the CIFAR-10 for uh, classification. And uh, yeah, that, I mean, it was just as useful, but I think the the images are more interesting for the autoencoder to explain. I, I think it's the same kind of guidelines you get, like you get a range for what the appropriate saturation is. But yeah, otherwise, yeah. Can I also like play with, a, like discover which types of convolution do I need? There are a bunch of them, which uh, sizes and... Yeah, uh, yeah, you can discover. Uh, you can definitely uh, in the code for it's a. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. It's at GitHub uh, slash Justin Shank slash Delve, and then there should be documentation explaining how the convolution works. So uh, you can. Uh, there's at least like some not implemented yet functions. So yeah, um, if you don't want to just take the, I think the average of the feature maps changing over time, then there's space to add another one and try with try adding a different kind of metric. Uh, basically, it's just you know, brute force uh, of different uh, uh, this uh, topology mm, structures. Brute, uh, brute force of the topology structures. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Mm. Right. And so, so you ju you just basically tried the, uh, all the types of uh, structures or. Uh. Or you just add law lawyer by lawyer? Yeah. Um, in this demo, it was kind of look. It was a brute force kind of to show you the how different la uh, layer sizes compare in, in the saturation. So yeah, it, I think it, for it to be useful at an application level, it still requires further fine tuning. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. question. What about more uh, complex computation graphs where you don't put the layers sequentially? Oh, good question. So if you have uh, more complex computation graphs where you don't put the layers sequentially, then you would probably, I think you'd still be able to save the output. Yeah, in this case, you'd still be able to save the output uh, of the pre-activation state uh, and the history. Um, and then you might get some really interesting dynamics, actually, because then you get like get feedbacks and you'd be wanting to find out if there's some kind of, I don't know, strange attractors that explain why the patterns move in this way or another. So for for the for this case that would be really interesting to see. Yeah. Next publication. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.